and we should be live, I think. Okay, give me just a second. Okay. Hello, Web Shadowers. Thank you all for attending this session today. This evening, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Maduri, who will be teaching us about physical medicine and rehabilitation. And as always, please remember that the Google, Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video at the end. With that being said, Dr. Maduri, you may start whenever you're ready. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Prithusha, and I am currently a PGY4 resident. Uh, doing my physical medicine and rehab residency. So I have a little presentation here today just to tell you guys about what PMNR is, um, how to get into residency, a little bit about myself, and we'll go through a case and some interesting learning points as well. Um, just to put it out there, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I don't have any affiliations with any pharma companies and Throughout my presentation, I'll try to use the generic names um, and any brand name usage does not indicate bias on my end. Um, all of the opinions and views are purely my own and or like hopefully evidence based and um, understandable for you guys, but they don't represent my academic institution or employer and I have no financial disclosures. Sorry, just all the boring stuff out of the way. <laughs> So a little bit about me. I did my undergrad in Rutgers University, New Jersey. I was a genetics major and psych minor. I am a DO and went to medical school at Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine. And I did my internship, sorry about the noise, uh, I guess city life, right? Um, I did my internship at Larkin Hospital in South Miami, Florida. and. Currently, I'm doing my PMNR residency here in New York at Montefiore Medical Center. Um, and next year, I'll be doing a brain injury fellowship uh, at Mount Sinai. So almost to the end, but I've chosen to subspecialize. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. So what is physical medicine and rehab? Um, has anyone heard about this out there? Um, I know Personally, for myself, I hadn't heard about physical medicine and rehab up until I was actually in medical school myself. Um, it's also known as physiatry, not necessarily to be confused with psychiatry, which I get a lot. Um, but really, it's the rehabilitation of patients with various medical issues, um, really focusing on neuromusculoskeletal issues. but. We also do see a lot of cardiac issues, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and we deal with prosthetics and orthotics. So how do we actually get into PM&R? Most uh, people go through a four year undergrad experience, uh, majoring in sciences uh, or some sort of health science. Um, you finish all your pre-med requirements, take your MCATs, which most of you are probably doing right now. You then go on to four years of medical school, either MD or DO. And um, I don't know if any of all, any of you out there listening know the difference between MD or DO school, um, but feel free to uh, say something in the chat if you do know, um, and I'll keep a lookout in the chat for you guys. Um, once you actually go to medical school, then you'll have to complete four years of residency training. And this is split up into the first year being a general medicine year, and then three years of specialized PM&R training. And once you guys actually go through the process, it can be a little confusing at, at first, but I'm gonna just put it out there so you guys know. When you're going through the match, there's something called a categorical or a prelim and advanced. So if you match, categorical, then that means all four years of your training are at one hospital versus if you match into a one-year prelim and a three-year advanced, your one-year prelim can uh, be at any hospital and that the three-year is, you know, can be at a different hospital than that. Um, oh, wow. Some interesting questions. Yeah. So someone got it right on the chat they're fairly similar but dos go through osteopathic manipulation training so 
throughout uh, the curriculum of a DO school, there's about two to 400 hours of extra workshops where you learn about musculoskeletal medicine and different types of manipulations you could do to work on soft tissue, bones, muscles, uh, and kind of everything in between, um, which, you know, as the PMNR doctor, that's like incredibly useful. And I think, I don't know about other fields, but I think being a DO has been, you know, a big advantage for me going into PMNR residency. So very good. What fellowships are included in PMNR? So there's a lot of uh, fellowships you can pursue. One of the great things about PMNR is that it's super versatile. It's very holistic. Uh, and there's a lot of different things you could do. Um, so sports medicine, interventional spine and pain, spinal cord injury, brain injury, women's and pelvic rehab, palliative care, cardiac rehab, PNO regenerative medicine, movement disorders. I mean, the list is really, this isn't even a fully comprehensive list, but um, you know, this, this field allows for so much versatility. And I think one of the great things about PMNR is if you have an interest in musculoskeletal and neuro kind of um, topics, but you don't know exactly what patient population you wanna work with, you don't know if you wanna do inpatient or outpatient, um, PMNR is a great field to consider because even once you get into PMNR, there's a huge range of things that you can do. So what specialized skills can you expect to learn in residency? Um, so usually most PMNR residencies aim to offer a very well-rounded experience. So you'll have inpatient and outpatient rotations. You'll also learn procedural skills like ultrasound, um, both diagnostic and procedural. So meaning if, if you want to um, scan, let's say, you know, a wrist and check out if there's inflammation or you want to scan a tendon, you can figure that out diagnostically or procedurally, meaning you can use the ultrasound as a modality for injections. Um, you also work uh, with patients who have baclofen pumps, uh, which we'll get into more later. Uh, botulinum toxin injections for patients with spasticity or migraines. And you also do uh, prosthetic and orthotics uh, fittings to work with patients who need prosthetic devices. So very interesting skill set uh, and probably something that might have a little bit of overlap with neurology and orthopedics, but uh, I think this is more focused in really rehabbing a patient and getting them back to their optimal functional lives. So going into our case, um, I have a 68 year old woman who is brought into the hospital by her family with right arm and leg weakness. What other history do you guys wanna know? And I have a little hint for you because uh, I know a lot of you guys have been doing um, cases with other other physicians, so hopefully this has been second nature to you now. But um, tell me, what what else do you guys want to know? And I have a little hint here. I'll wait for the chat here. Okay, so okay, cool. In stroke. All right, great. Um, so old cards and OPQRST is a uh, little mnemonics that you can use to take history, right? So mm -hmm. onset one hour ago, location, her right arm and leg is weak. Um, duration, it's constant. Characterizing, it's weakness any associated factors. So she also has slurring of speech. She's a little lethargic. She has a headache. Remitting factors, nothing makes it better. And as far as treatments, her family gave her aspirin, 325 milligrams at home, uh, but her symptoms are still persisting. She has no pain in her extremities, but her headaches she rates as a four out of 10. Now, what other history would you like to know? So we have our history of present illness, which is why they're there right, right then and there, right? Um, but there's more to figure out with their history. 
So just to move on, um, past medical history. She has uh, obesity, she has hypertension, she's diabetic, and she has hyperlipidemia. Family history, uh, her father had an MI and he passed at age 82. Social history. So this is something I think a little more unique to PMNR physicians. We love to hear about social and functional history because our main goal, no matter what part of uh, PMNR you're working in, is to get a patient back to their most optimal, best functional selves. So we love to know what are they currently doing? Where do they live? What's their family situation? And so here's a little social history. Um, she lives in a third floor, floor apartment with her family. She has elevator access. Now this, as little as it, as it might sound, elevator access is a huge deal because now if this patient suddenly has weakness going home, she's gonna have to negotiate stairs versus if she has an elevator, she can go straight up. Uh, other things that we know about her social history, she's a former smoker, uh, she's never done any illicit drugs, no alcohol use, and she's not currently working. Okay, great. I see uh, some questions. Oh, what is an MI? So an MI is a myocardial infarction um, and it's a heart attack. That's right. So here's some more functional history. Like I said, we PM&R doctors love functional history. So patient was previously using a cane to walk mod I. So we use these this grading system to uh, really quickly communicate to each other how functional or how much assistance is a patient requiring with whatever task they're trying to do. So let's say with ambulating, walking, she's a mod I. So she's modified independent, meaning she's independent, but she needs a cane to walk. So that's why it's considered modified. Um, Otherwise, she was walking independently and she was able to perform all her activities of daily living. So this includes feeding oneself, grooming oneself, uh, showering, eating, uh, doing your hobbies, uh, getting into bed, all of these things she was able to do independently. So knowing all this, uh, let's move on to our physical exam findings. So a little, a few of you kind of mentioned this earlier that, you know, you're interested in a neurologic exam. Um, so let's, let's get, get to see what our physical exam shows. Oops, one second, I think I went too far. Okay, so her physical exam, her vitals, her heart rate is 121. And is that normal? Um, no, some of you are, are saying no. So um, her heart rate is 121. She's a little tachycardic. Her blood pressure is 100 over 70, which is not perfectly normal, but you know it's a little on the low side, right? Her temperature is 98.7, which is normal. Her O2 saturation, 98% on room air. So she's breathing well. Generally, when you look at her, uh, she's obese. Uh, she's in mild distress. She's uncomfortable. Um, maybe she's anxious. That's why her heart rate is high. This is kind of what's going through my mind if I'm reading this. Um, her cardiac, uh, cardiac exam, it's irregularly regular, which means this patient is most likely having atrial fibrillation, um, which is an arrhythmia, right? So her heart, um, her atria is beating faster and at an irregular rhythm than her ventricles. So pulmonary, she's clear to auscultation, no rails or bronchi, her abdomen, soft, non-tender. So she has some interesting findings in her, in her exam already, right? But we're, we knowing, you know, that she had muscle weakness and uh, right-sided weakness, and that's what she came in for, we really want to know her neuromusculoskeletal exam. So again, what kind of things are we looking for? Oh, what are her respirations like? Um, I'll say that they're normal. Okay. Her neuro exam. So she's ANO times one. ANO stands for alert and oriented times one. She only knows her name. So she's a little confused, right? 
She doesn't follow our commands. She cannot repeat no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, she speaks fluently, but does not make any sense. Her cranial nerves, uh, she has a mild facial droop. Otherwise, her cranial nerves 1 through 12 are intact. But we do notice she's also having some difficulty swallowing. Um, her muscle strength. So we use a scale out of five to always grade muscle strength. So especially on a neurologic or physiatric exam, um, we, we go with zero, meaning there's absolutely no muscle movement. One and two, there's a little bit of muscle movement, but it's uh, unable to be lifted up against gravity. So three, if a patient can just go like this or lift up an arm, uh, against gravity, that's considered a three. Four is considered lifting up against gravity and a little bit of resistance. But let's say you as a doctor, you're testing the patient and you're giving them a little bit of resistance and you can break through, that's considered a four. Versus a five is you know their full strength. Um, when you're testing them, it's, it's much harder to break through. And you think that four that patient's um, age and gender and body habitus, that's probably the max amount of strength they'll, they'll put in. That's considered a five out of five. So here we see that on her left side, she's five out of five, she's great. But on the right side, she's zero out of five, meaning she has nothing. She's completely paretic on the right side. Um, so next we go to sensation. So she has intact uh, dermatomal distribution. Um, so just reading a few of these comments, what does MSK stand for? So musculoskeletal. Good. So looks like signs of a stroke. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Reflexes, um, zero out of four on the right side, two out of four on the left side. So reflexes, again, they're graded. We have a grading system for reflexes. So two out of four is considered normal and zero out of four is considered hyporeflexic, right? Hypo means low, hyper means high. So on the left side, she's normal. On the right side, she's hyporeflexic. She's not really responding. Um, by the way, some of these abbreviations, so LUE, left upper extremity, right upper extremity, left lower extremity, and right lower extremity. Okay, so moving on. What do you think this patient has? Stroke vibes, I like that. Very good. So just to kind of speed it along, um, I, you know, we did some lab work on her. All, everything came back with the normal limits, but we did uh, a, a MRI brain and this is what showed up. So this is a T2 MRI brain without contrast. Whenever we're suspecting stroke, uh, we always want to do an MRI without contrast, because if you give a patient contrast and they're hemorrhaging, you will affect and uh, initially like poison the brain tissue a little bit more. Um, and then as far as the differences between MRIs T1 MRI versus T2 MRI, the way to remember it and kind of like the quick, quick and dirty way to remember it is T2 H2O will be bright. So, you know, in this situation, we could see that this entire area is, is bright, right? So we think that she had a stroke uh, because it's bright, you know, we're wondering maybe this is a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, but, you know, let's go on and, and see. By the way, this territory, what do you guys think? What vessel do you think was affected in this woman? Do we know any guesses? Great. So seeing some really, really awesome responses here. So yes, we have a stroke. We think that it's the left middle cerebral artery based on her MRI. And 
I guess the question is why, right? Why do people really get strokes? Um, and so this patient, she has multiple risk factors. Uh, she's obese, she has hypertension, she has atrial fibrillation, um, she was a former smoker. And so all of these things are, are risk factors for stroke. And just to go into that a little bit more, uh, when we think about risk factors, we always think about non-modifiable and modifiable. So things that are non-modifiable risk factors are things that we can't change. So things like age, uh, your gender, males are more likely than females to have strokes, your race, um, family history. If your family, someone in your immediate family, your mom or your dad or a brother or sister had a stroke, you are also more at risk. Maybe there was a congenital reason. Um, those are all things you can't really change, right? Then on the other side of the coin, there's also modifiable risk factors. So hypertension, if you've had a stroke before, if you have any sort of heart disease, carotid stenosis, um, something called a patent foramen ovale, where in your heart, there's a, a, a hole in your heart and that causes irregularities in your blood, blood flow and a thrombus to form. You might be, you know, forming a thrombus in your heart. And then one fine day that thrombus happens to uh, be embolized into your brain, God forbid. Things like diabetes, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, smoking, high dose estrogen. So um, things like certain birth controls, they, they put you at risk for stroke because they make you more likely to clot your blood. So, you know, it, when you're taking birth control, there's always a part of uh, the label that says, always see your doctor, make sure you have no other blood disorders um, and you know that your OCP might be putting you at higher risk for stroke. So, which I have seen um, in the past, but you know, generally it's, it's women who also have something else that's going on with them plus the birth control that puts them over the edge and makes them have a stroke. Um, and so just to take a little bit of an aside from our case, and I promise we'll get back and find out what happened to our woman, uh, just to talk a little bit about stroke epidemiology. So the American Heart Association estimates that 795,000 uh, strokes occur annually and 610,000 uh, cases are new cases. There's nearly 6.8 million stroke survivors in the United States. This was an old statistic from 2010, but I can tell you that stat is actually way higher now. Um, and then in the first 30 days after a stroke, 90% of deaths were due to the direct effects of brain lesion or complications of immobility. So this is really, really crucial. And this is one of the biggest places where uh, PM&R doctors come in because if immobility is causing 90% of the deaths after stroke, that's huge. That, what does that tell us? That means that within the first 30 days, mobilization of a patient, getting them to move, getting them to try to walk around, getting them back on their feet, solving all their medical issues is crucial. Um, and in general, after a stroke, like we, a lot of times we always focus on, you know, the patient comes into the ER, they have a stroke and, you know, the neurologists and the neurointerventionalists do what they can to treat them. But really the real work of healing comes afterwards, right? So what kind of things do we even do in rehab uh, to help these patients? So we'll talk about that in a bit too. So just to go over a little bit of the anatomy. So we, we talked about our patient. She had a middle cerebral artery stroke. And so just to kind of point out where that is. So we have our aorta and our heart is underneath this, right? So uh, whenever we have normal blood flow, our heart pumps out to the aorta and then it kind of distributes amongst the subclavian vessels and then goes up into our carotid arteries and into the circle of Willis at the bottom of the brain, which is highlighted here in this picture. So if you're looking at the brain bottom up, there's a structure called the circle of Willis that really comes off and has the vast amount of uh, blood circulation to our entire brain. And the middle cerebral artery are uh, these guys, these big uh, vessels that come off right in the middle of the circle of Willis. Um, of course, there's other big players in it too. Uh, the other kind of two biggest arteries or two 
uh, yeah, the two biggest arteries that come off are the anterior cerebral arteries, which come off in the front, and the posterior uh, cere uh, cerebral arteries, which come off back here. And then we have all of these vessels, which take care of our more uh, primitive functions or our brainstem. Um, now, when you have a stroke, uh, there's two types of strokes. There's uh, ischemic and hemorrhagic, right? And so ischemic strokes, they happen when a thrombus of some sort, whether it's a blood clot or uh, like a vascular plaque or uh, an atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, and, you know, what, whatever it is, it's clogging up a vessel and it's causing a lack of blood flow into our brain. So um, what you can do is if, if you get the patient there to the hospital in time and there's all sorts of criteria that a patient needs to fill, but a neurointerventionalist can go look at this patient and look at their CT scan and or, and or MRI and choose to perform something called a thrombectomy. And so what they do is they guide a catheter up into the vessels of the brain and do what it kind of sounds like, it, you know, excise the thrombus. So in this situation, we could see this thrombectomy, uh, this thrombus is in the middle cerebral artery. And, you know, these are some pictures of how they kind of guide this balloon catheter and go all the way up into the brain and just, they pull that uh, thrombus out, which revascularizes and restores blood, for, blood flow to the area. So talking more, a little more about the blood supply to the brain, right? So the three biggest arteries I mentioned, the anterior cerebellar artery, the middle cerebral artery, and the posterior uh, cerebral artery are kind of the biggest arteries that supply the uh, co cortexes of our brain. So you can see here at the blue, the middle cerebral artery, which is what we're most concerned about, uh, on cross-section, we could see that it's kind of this area. And uh, if you're looking at the brain laterally, it, it takes care of all of these kind of areas. And we'll go into what these areas do. And then if you're looking at the, uh, the bottom of the brain, it's kind of these areas. So like the hemispheric areas, right? And so what's actually located in these areas? Does anyone know? Um, or has anyone seen this picture before? I'm going to wait for the chat and see what happens. <laughs> ah, okay, great. Homunculus. So yes, this is the homunculus. Uh, this is a very uh, schematic kind of drawing to uh, show what parts of the brain are controlled by which parts of the motor cortex. So we can kind of see at the bottom here, there's the pharynx, the tongue, things about the face, uh, nose, eye. And then as it goes higher up, we expect to see parts of the hand, the elbow, the wrist, and the legs and toes, right? So it's interesting. This is exactly the territory that is affected in an MCA stroke. So in our patient, we saw that she had um, a facial droop, so that explains the phase. She had arm weakness, she had leg weakness, and we can expect these territories and uh, you know stroke areas to be pretty significant because look at how much, you know, they essentially control the entire you know side of that body, uh, and so you know it it kind of stands to reason that our patient you know it, it explains why our patient had such significant deficits. So what else is located in the MCA territory? So there's two areas that control language in our brain. Um, I mean, there's many more, but two of the main areas are Wernicke's and Broca's area. And these two areas help us comprehend knowledge, respond to language, and then broadcast uh, language out as well. So these two areas, they communicate through something called the articulate, or arcuate fasciculus, excuse me. And so when these are lesioned, we can also see significant deficits in language. Uh, deficits in language uh, when they're acquired are called uh, aphasia. So if you hear me use that word, then you know this is what I'm talking about. It's, it's their deficit in language and communication. 
So going back to our physical exam, I had mentioned that our patient is uh, alert and oriented times one only to her name. So she's a little confused. She does not follow commands. She cannot repeat no ifs, ands, or buts. She speaks fluently, but does not make sense. So one of the reasons why we ask these questions specifically is because in, in my head, when I'm evaluating patients, uh, I want to know if they're doing these three things because in my head, I'm going through this kind of algorithm. So is this patient fluent? So yes, she speaks fluently, right? But she makes no sense um, and she can't repeat or follow commands. So that kind of points to, yes, she's fluent, but is she understanding what I'm saying? Probably not. Um, and I also asked her, can you repeat the phrase, no ifs, ands, or buts? And she wasn't able to repeat it. So in this algorithm in my head, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe this patient has a Wernicke aphasia. And so the specific reason that we ask them to repeat no ifs, ands, or buts is because number one, I'm asking to see if they're able to follow my command. But number two, the phrase no ifs, ands, or buts actually goes through all of the three major sounds that uh, we make during communication. They're called buccal, uh, palatal, and lingual. So the phrase no ifs, ands, or buts is testing different parts of their vocal cords and sound making and communication mechanism. So Wernicke's aphasia is a pretty severe aphasia. And I can tell you right now that oftentimes it's, it's kind of hard on an initial exam to really figure out uh, which aphasia they have. It takes a lot of um, kind of fine tuning and picking out. But I do have an example of a patient who has Wernicke's aphasia and it's, it's very profound. So I'm just gonna play this quick little video for you guys. Um, and let me know if you can. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. <laughs> what are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people for them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. They'll save in the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to We will to store it right here and they'll save their hands right there for and them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad that we were doing. We, from, like here? I'd like my change for me and change hands for me. It would happen. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them with them. I'm very happy with them. Good. This girl was fairly good and happy when I play golf and hit other trees we play out okay so you guys you guys get the the idea there right so he is you know like a, this happy-go-lucky guy but he doesn't really understand what's going on he speaks fluently he's talking about a lot of stuff but it makes absolutely no sense and patients with Wernicke's a lot of times they're you know in this situation luckily he's he's a very uh jovial kind of patient but a lot of times, especially initially, he there's a lot of frustration because they're trying to communicate and they wonder why, why doesn't anyone else understand me? They themselves sometimes don't realize that they don't make sense because in their head, they are speaking perfectly fine. So it's a discrepancy between understanding language and then interpreting language. And then again, the motor part of it actually coming out. So going to the next slide. Okay, so getting back to our patient. So she had a left-sided middle uh, cerebral artery stroke, likely secondary to her atrial fibrillation, right? We said AFib was uh, an arrhythmia that predisposes uh, patients to stroke because, um, you know, similar to a pain foramen ovale, atrial fibrillation creates disturbances in our blood flow in the heart and can um, predispose us to form thrombuses 
in the heart. So if in whatever situation, if one fine day that thrombus goes to our brain, that'll lead to a stroke. Um, one thing I didn't put on here is we did look at a T2 MRI, right? And we said T2 is like H2O, so water is bright. Um, and so that T2 MRI suggested that she may have had a hemorrhagic conversion, which can happen. Um, so a stroke can initially start as an ischemic stroke. And then if the pressure is too high or, you know, for whatever reason, it might, the blood vessel might burst. Um, and uh, they might have a hemorrhage afterwards, which could explain why her blood pressure was low. Um, so in this situation, we consulted neurosurgery. They didn't give uh, TPA, which I should probably explain what that is. It's a, it's a medication um, that you can also give to patients with stroke if they have a thrombus that uh, can break up the clot, but there's also a whole bunch of criteria to give, give that medication. So in this situation, they didn't give TPA and they decided to perform a thrombectomy. So we don't know, maybe, maybe this hemorrhagic part happened after they did the thrombectomy. Um, generally you wouldn't perform a thrombectomy unless it was an ischemic stroke, but you know, there in this situation, maybe it happened afterwards. Um, so anyway, all that aside, as a physiatrist or a physical medicine and rehab doctor, what are we going to do about this, right? So my job is to come in and help these patients get back on their feet and get back to their optimal functional selves. And one of the biggest things that I do that's different from a lot of other doctors is I work with a huge team of people. So I work with physical therapists and, you know, with them, I address more musculoskeletal gross motor complaints. So with them, I work to uh, work on her right-sided weakness. I'll work with occupational therapy to work more on her arm weakness and learn all her activities of daily living. I'll work with speech therapy to help with the language swallow and the aphasia type symptoms. And also as a physician, and taking care as a leader on the medical team, you're also working to manage the pharmaceutical and medical aspect of these patients. So on my uh, stroke units, they'll generally, you know, the neurologists and the neurointerventionalists will do their thing, um, but it's my job to make sure that their blood pressure is still being controlled. They're taking the aspirin, atorvastatin uh, for their cholesterol medications, their blood pressure to be good. And um, like I said, my goal is to make this patient as close to her functional baseline as possible. Because this patient had atrial fibrillation, generally there are sometimes uh, undergoing cardiac workups on my floor too. So the cardiac team will be called to see why is she having AFib? Is there anything else we could do? Any other medications she should be on? Other things that I'm really concerned about, especially in my stroke patients, so I'm always concerned about sleep-wake cycles. I wanna make sure that every patient is having a good night's sleep because as cheesy as it sounds, you really need that seven to nine hours per night for optimal neuro recovery. If your patient is too sleepy, um, you, can't, uh, you, you can use you, environmental cues to regulate their sleep-wake cycles. So things like lighting, noise, making sure their curtains are drawn in the morning. You can also consider pharmacologic agents like neurostimulants in the mornings and then more sedating or natural or calming medications at night like melatonin. You always want to avoid benzodiazepines because number one, they're addictive. And number two, they're really bad for the neurochemistry of a patient who's trying to undergo neuro recovery after any sort of stroke or brain injury. Um, and then as far as just general rehab guidelines, uh, one, when they're admitted to an acute rehab floor, they have to be able to tolerate three hours of therapy per day. So if a patient's sleeping all day, they're not getting anywhere. So I try my best to make sure they're awake during the day and sleeping at night. Um, also agitation and confusion. A lot of times patients are just confused. They don't know exactly what's going on, uh, why they're there, what happened. So this is a natural part of uh, going through brain recovery. And the best way to overcome it is honestly just reorienting them, having environmental cues, having a board with their name, the date, who's taking care of them there, that day, a phone number they can call to reach the front desk. Um, or the nurse's station is really important. Um, skin pressure uh, and ulcer prevention. So you can imagine that when a patient has sudden weakness uh, and they're unable to move around in bed, 
uh, they predispose themselves to having pressure ulcers. And this is really dangerous because pressure ulcers come out of nowhere and they can cause skin breakdown, infection, and um, it's just a whole host of complications you don't need. So all the time we're telling our nursing staff to turn over a patient every two to four hours because um, at about the four hour mark, if someone is just sitting in bed, they start developing slight ischemia or loss of um, blood circulation to their skin. And that causes, you know, deeper and deeper uh, ischemic issues. So I check their sacrums, their heel, their occiput, the back of their head for skin breakdown, all those high pressure areas bowel and bladder, I want to make sure they're not constipated, they're going all the time. Um, DVTs, when a patient is immobile, it puts them at high risk for blood clots, um, a DVT or deep vein thrombosis. So uh, I always try to give them pneumatic sleeves, which are these big kind of pressurized systems that squeeze your legs when in bed. Um, and then you can also use uh, pharmacologic interventions. And then the last thing we're always looking at is GI prophylaxis. So prolonged immobility in bed uh, predisposes you to gastritis and heartburn and um, uh, ulcers in your stomach lining. So you're always trying to make sure and avoid that. So like I said, criteria for acute inpatient rehab, they need to be able to tolerate three hours of therapy a day. They should be able to at least minimally follow commands or be re redirected and Ideally, they're medically stable, um, you know, meaning they're not ICU level patients. They're kind of calmed down from their acute issue and now they're on the up and up trying to, uh, you know, build back to their normal selves. Okay, what are some things we can do? So here's the, the fun part of therapy. So what are we actually gonna do to get these patients better? So for their aphasia, right, we said this patient had Wernicke's aphasia. So we're going to do speech therapy, try to work on all their oropharyngeal muscles. We can give them picture boards as a means to point out and try to communicate. Strict schedules and routine are crucial for these patients because even if they don't understand uh, the language that's being communicated to them, generally, for the most part, they can at least take cues and realize, oh, it's morning. Oh, it's night you know, after this comes this activity. So routine is really important for them to give them a sense of stability in their in their day to day. There's all sorts of different aphasia treatments um, that can help too. So we work with our speech therapists to do that. And then educating the families is also huge. Um, for the dysphagia, so dysphagia means trouble swallowing. And um, as we mentioned, one of the areas that's affected is our oropharynx area, right, in an MCA stroke. So a lot of times patients have uh, difficulty swallowing. And so what we do is we work with our speech therapists and do something called a modified barium swallow. So what this entails is you give a patient a certain consistency of food, whether it's solids, liquids, uh, honey thick, puree, whatever it is, it's mixed with a teeny bit of contrast dye. Then they go under this machine and we can watch them actually swallow live. And we can see, so this is where the food bolus is. And we can see it's kind of getting stuck here. This area is called the volecula. And um, it's, a, it's a frequent area where patients may get food stuck. Um, so we can see this patient struggling a little bit to swallow, swallow, and then it looks like they do another swallow, still unsuccessful. And they're kind of struggling through it. Um, they take another bite. Let's watch where this goes. And this one goes straight through into their esophagus. So we can kind of see that, okay, maybe this patient is getting a little bit of food stuck in that molecular area, but overall his swallow function looks okay. So this is not the clearest slide, but there's four phases to the swallow, the oral preparatory phase, which is kind of just forming a food bolus. And then the transport phase, the pharyngeal phase, when it actually goes into that back of the throat area and then the esophageal phase. Um, a couple of you are asking, so what is this machine? It's a modified barium swallow. And um, no, it's not painful to the patients. Um, it's just a machine that is hooked up to see uh, contrast. 
So what are some other strategies we can prescribe? So for the right-sided weakness, our physical therapists work with our patients to um, examine their daily progression and strength, um, spasticity, which is a complication that can, uh, that can happen after stroke. They start with patients very you know, gentle, just gentle range of motion. Then they start with them sitting at the edge of a bed. They practice postural tolerance with them. And then once they're kind of ready, um, they can progress up to walking with a harness like you see in this patient. And eventually, hopefully you can hope they, they can walk with a walker or a cane. So talking a little bit about stages of motor recovery. So as soon as you have a stroke and you have complete uh, one-sided weakness, that stage is called stage one. This is flaccidity. As uh, you progress throughout your motor recovery, you can start to have some, some synergies. And so generally in the upper arm, it's called flexor synergy, where you'll see the elbow and the wrist both flex towards the midline of the body. Um, then you'll see sometimes spasticity, where spasticity is a velocity dependent uh, change in motor control. So if you try to move their arm slow, they'll be able to go through their entire range of motion. But if you try to move their arm fast, you'll see that it'll catch. So the stages of spasticity progress and then slowly, slowly, they may start to regain motor control. And then finally, hopefully, if all goes well and motor recovery is, is you know, followed through to the end of these stages, you'll see some isolated and coordinated movement. In the first three to six months after brain injury or stroke, that's when the brain is at the peak of remodeling and neuroplasticity. So it's super important to get these patients into rehab ASAP. How can you predict uh, how well a patient might recover? So um, depending on how severe the stroke is, you, you can um, sometimes say how good or bad their recovery chances are. Um, if you have complete arm paralysis, there's um, really only uh, a 9% chance that you'll have good recovery of good hand function. If you have some recovery by four weeks, there's a 70% chance of making good recovery. Um, and then there's some poor prognosticating factors. So if you have no measurable grasp by four weeks or your flaccidity period is very long, um, that kind of indicates a, a more poor prognosis as far as actually recovering motor, motor recovery wise. There's all sorts of therapies that we use to try to get patients to um, move again and be, be the best versions of themselves. So this is one, one thing that some of our therapists use called mirror box therapy. therapy is another tool that's being used in stroke rehabilitation. Um, it's being utilized to maximize or to get the most out of neuroplasticity, which just means um, getting the brain to, um, to function or you know to function again um and what mirror therapy has been uh its studies have been done on it and and they use you know functional mris to kind of look at the brain while doing mirror therapy um, and they find that there are parts of the affected hemisphere that were affected by the stroke um do fire in certain areas um when the patient looks at their you know, um, unaffected hand in the mirror. Um. So you could see basically what she's saying is when you are encouraging a patient to write with their affected hand, but using the mirror to reflect that, um, you can kind of trick the brain into firing in the area that was uh, ischemic. Um, it won't fire completely like normal, but it's kind of a good first start to get the, get the brain and those connections kind of going again. Therapy is another tool that's being okay. Um, we have uh, a few video, a couple of videos uh, here just to show you what flaccidity versus spasticity kind of looks like. Um, and I'll just I won't play all of it, but just to kind of go through. So this is a physical therapist working with a patient that has complete uh, one-sided flaccidity, and you could see that really they they have to do all of the motion. So she's passively ranging him through the different motions of his arm and eventually she'll do his leg. But um, in a patient that has absolutely no 
motor function at all, this is still really important because you are still providing some sort of um, stimulation to the nerve endings that maybe hopefully can um, soon enough reconnect uh, our, our peripheral nervous system with our central nervous system. And so this is in comparison to a patient who has uh, a more spastic weakness. They're weak, but they also- Spastic diplegia is a form of cerebral palsy where it's a chronic neuromuscular condition with hypertonia or spasticity. This means that they have especially high tightness in the muscles of the lower extremity, including the legs, hips, and pelvis. So you could see, I know they, the video said uh, this is a patient with cerebral palsy, but the kind of analogy is similar where a patient who has spasticity will have um, some amount of tone that allows them to bear weight on that leg, but uh, they don't have full motor function where they can control it like their normal leg would. So some, you end up having these different kinds of gates. Uh, and spasticity isn't always bad. It's a sign that motor recovery is happening. Sometimes it can be helpful for a patient to have that extra tone because at least they can balance. Um, but when it gets to a point uh, where it's affecting their function in a negative way, let's say their arm is so spastic that you can't um, abduct it and perform axillary hygiene or something like that, you would really want to um, do something to loosen it up. Um, there's a lot of things we can do for spasticity. So kind of going back to our patient, that one, that same patient, she cam comes back a year later and she's doing much better since going to rehab, but she feels that she still has right foot weakness and spasticity. So like we said, spasticity is a velocity dependent increase in muscle tone. And this isn't uh, something to be confused with dystonia, which maybe some of you have heard those words before. Um, but Dystonia is different than spasticity because spasticity is velocity dependent, whereas dystonia is not. And so what can we actually do um, and how do we kind of wrap our heads around this? So like everything, there's a scale for spasticity. Um, so it's called the modified Ashworth scale. It goes from zero to four and it helps indicate to ourselves and other providers how bad is this patient's uh, spasticity. So zero, there's no increase, one and one plus, there's a slight increase, a catch, and then you can help the patient go through the rest of their range of motion. Two, there's a much more marked increase. There's no catch, but you can still go through the rest of the range of motion. Three, there's a considerable increase in muscle tone and you cannot get to the end range. And then four is that it's just rigid. No matter how much you push or like, you know, force you apply, you cannot get them through that in entire range of motion. So there's a lot of treatments for spasticity out there. There's medications, um, there's botulinum toxin, which um, you may or may not have heard of. So it's also known as Botox, that's the brand name of it. And a lot of times when we hear Botox, we think of like facial, and aesthetic purposes for it, right? But Botox has a huge role in uh, helping our spasticity patients because it works at the level of the neuromuscular junction between nerves and muscles. And so it basically cuts off the feedback loop uh, of, of those spastic muscles. Um, if it's really bad, you can always consider tendon releases or something called a baclofen pump. So a baclofen pump, this is a picture of it right here. It's basically a pump that has a catheter that goes directly to the uh, intradural space and spinal cord and gives uh, a medication called baclofen, which is a muscle relaxer. So um, the advantage of, of this is if you have maxed out on oral doses of a muscle relaxants for these patients and their spasticity is so diffuse, it's in both their arms, it's in both their legs or whatever the case might be, if it's so severe um, and you can't you know, go higher on the oral medications, a baclofen pump might be the next best step. And uh, you know, there's the last step is also bracing. So a lot of these things kind of work in conjunction with one another. Maybe you give them um, anti-spasticity medications and you also brace them. So bracing for spasticity. So this patient, um, which is kind of an interesting uh, patient video. Uh, so you feel kind of light when I pick it up. So you got to feel that's that's all, that's all thing. Thing. I think you're right.
Now once you walk back and forth sideways. All right, now let's have you lay back down here and we're gonna examine your foot. All right, so I'm gonna compare feet here. So um, I want Okay, you see, you saw that, right? So the left foot was significantly weaker, so. See, I feel kind of light when I pick it up. So you got to be a nerve. That's all, that's all thing think of. I think you're right. Sorry about that. So uh, you guys caught that, right? The left foot was weaker. And so what can we do about this? Um, so a lot of times, and one of you know the clinics that I frequently do uh, in my day-to-day -day job is a brace and orthotics clinic. And so there's all sorts of different braces, uh, different prosthetics we can use for a variety of different reasons. So for a patient like this, who has a stroke and um, ankle weakness, right? Um, we prescribe something called ankle foot orthoses. And this pictured is a semi-rigid ankle foot or orthoses. So semi-rigid meaning it's made of thermoplastic, but uh, you know, it has areas of some mobility. So the ankle joint has some uh, range and capability of motion. All of these are custom molded and they are, you know, really intricately thought of, of exactly what a patient's functional needs are, what is their day-to-day -day life and baseline like. And so for a patient with just foot drop, um, something like this might be the best way to go. But, you know, let's say in the case that you're an athlete and you're the superstar who loves to run and you don't want to be um, held back by, you know, an amputation or something like that, that might've happened to you. Um, I take the case of Oscar Leonard, um, who you might know as AKA the Blade Runner. He was the first uh, double leg amputee to participate in the Olympic games. And he had these really neat spring loaded ankle foot prostheses, which um, I guess it could be argued, you know, does this give you an advantage over people who don't have amputations because these spring loaders really give you a lot of speed if you can find the balance for them. Um, and so this guy, he ran the entire race with them and it was pretty incredible. Um, he unfortunately had a double limb amputation because of a congenital limb deformity. Uh, and then just to kind of also mention as an aside, uh, botulinum toxin can be used, like I said, for many purposes, more than just aesthetically. Um, one of the other things that we do in uh, brain injury rehab is uh, use this for migraine headaches. So if patients are maxed out on all of the oral medications that they could take, uh, we sometimes do botulinum toxin for migraines. And uh, what it entails is uh, injecting uh, small amounts of botulinum toxins in multiple multiple muscle groups. So we see like the corrugator, the frontalis, um, the occipitalis, the temporalis on both sides, and then wherever they have uh, increased tone in their paraspinal musculature as well as their traps. And so that kind of brings me to the end of my case and just kind of touching on um, all the little things that you know make my job super interesting. And I guess just, to, uh, just as an aside, I can tell you like why I chose PMNR um, because uh, I think maybe it might help some of you out there uh, trying to figure out your life goals, right? So whenever I was going through medical school, I really loved learning about neurology, musculoskeletal medicine and osteopathic manipulation. Um, and I wasn't like a huge surgery person, um, but I still liked procedures. So anyway, here's me in clinic and we're working on one of our co-residents um, working on her cervicals and just doing some manipulation there. And, you know, this is like really a joy in my life. Um, I also really loved the lifestyle that PMNR had to offer. Um, while it's, it can be demanding and residency, you know, is residency, it's always hard. I still found a lot of time to do really cool things. Um, and my friends and co-residents along the way were incredible. I was, you know, able to get married and everyone was super supportive about that. Um, my work-life balance is really, really nice. Um, 
not so much in residency. I think, you know, sometimes we will always get stuck on those rotations that have long work hours and that's just part of training. But in general, um, there's not that much call. There's not too, too many emergencies that really happen in PM&R um, unless you want to. So yeah, I think that uh, for me, it was a good fit for what I wanted to do and what my passions in medicine were. And then not to mention, like I said, I wasn't like a person who, um, you know, wanted to do surgeries, but I still really like to use my hands and I loved procedures. And so I like to do ultrasound injections, acupuncture. This is me in one of our acupuncture workshops and we were doing ear acupuncture, which sounds scarier than it is, I promise. Um, but, you know, we put uh, acupuncture needles in different parts of the ear and just you know, I actually felt better from it. So that was something I learned uh, from that workshop. Um, and then the patient population, a lot of times the people who end up at my uh, door are pe people who have been to a lot of other specialists. They don't know what else to do or in the situation of acute rehab, they've been through a whole hospital course already. And finally, finally, they're at rehab and ready to get their life back in order. So it kind of um, takes the dread out of some parts of medicine. And I like love the rehab part of it because it makes me really happy. And um, I'm really happy to motivate and give hope to my patients. And um, every patient is different. You know, even in stroke rehab, I've seen a ton of MCA strokes, but literally no two strokes have ever been the same. Um, so it allows me to be creative, tailor my treatment plans and really have fun. And then as far as, uh, I guess, a little bit of advice, um, one of the best things uh, of advice and one, that's one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever gotten was chase your flow state. And so uh, to me, what a flow state is, is one of those things that you can do that really you get immersed in. You look down and before you know it, you look back up and um, an hour, two hours have passed by. I, I think those, those, pay attention to those moments in your life because um, those are the moments where you know your real passion is coming forth and um, you can really follow your dreams and follow your heart and be true to yourselves um, in, in your medicine practice. And so I guess that's a little bit about me and a little bit about why I chose PM&R. Hopefully this was enjoyable. <laughs> Um, you can always contact me, feel free to email me, catch me on my Insta. I just started it. So like, you know, it's really, there's not much on there, <laughs> but hopefully more to come. Um, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to post it in the live stream and, um, I'll, I'll answer any questions you guys might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Maduri, um, for this wonderful presentation and taking time out of your day to present for us. Um, we all learned so much. Thank you. No problem. Um, everyone make sure to check out her socials. Her Instagram is PM Rehab Doc. Yeah. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Maduri. Um, to all of our participants, before we end today's session, we have an announcement to make. This Friday will be the start of our January roundup. So for those of you who are new or aren't so familiar with our roundups, we host monthly roundups that allow you to go back and watch previous live streams that you did not attend, allowing you to earn credit for these past sessions of the month. Every form for the month of January will open this Friday at 11.59 p.m. EST and will close Sunday at 11.59 p.m. EST. You will be able to access these forms through a document that will be available on our website um, when the roundup period opens. And additionally, every link is also in the description of each video. And we also have a playlist pertaining to each month to make it easier for all of you. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Maduri. We loved your presentation. You. It was such an honor to have you tonight. And thank you all so much for attending. The Google form has now been posted. And so please fill it out within the next 30 minutes. Additionally, the link will also be in our description. It's in the description right now, so. Perfect. Thank you so much.